Hey, good morning. It's, it's good to see you. How many have done everything over this Christmas holiday but fasting? Amen. You've eaten like I have. You feel like you should ask for forgiveness for how much food you've eaten. I know I do. And that's the way it is. Hey, we're, we're so glad you're here. We're going to talk just a few minutes this morning about fasting. You may not, never have heard about fasting. Uh, fasting is really uh, refraining from food. Uh, when it comes to the Bible setting, it's, uh, fasting has to do with refraining for a greater purpose. And that's different. How many of you have ever been on a diet? Amen. Like one guy said, I've lost, uh, I've lost 500 pounds. I lost 10 of it, and then I gained it back, and I lost another 10, and I gained it back, and I lost another 10, and he added up, he thinks he's lost 500 pounds. And he only weighs 280, so maybe you know how that works. Uh, so we're going to talk just a few moments this morning. Maybe uh, you've never fasted before, and I need you to consider this morning. You, uh, I was talking about this morning, and Rob gave me this, this great question question we asked earlier have you ever fasted fasting <laughs> have you ever had the church going to fast and you're going oh man we got a, like a family reunion tomorrow and there's gonna be good food and aunt bella's gonna be there with their lasagna and this just is like the timing's not right for me amen how many of you know the timing's never right to fast <laughs> here's what will happen i promise you if you commit to fast people will call you and they will ask you to go to a lobster dinner. And you haven't heard from them in eight years. But they will call during your fast and just dangle the lobster out there. And you go, I think I'm going to fast my fast. And then I'll get back on a fast. Or, no, no I've done this. And I've negotiated with the Lord. Amen. Have you ever done that? It's like, Lord, I'm fasting for seven days. Somebody provides a lobster dinner. I go, can I go to the lobster dinner and add an extra day to my seven-day fast? And uh, I've done that before. Uh, I've cheated and <laughs> asked the Lord to forgive me. And it's a reminder, fasting's not like the first thing on your list to do. Uh, but here's what I, I kind of want you to get this morning, is that fasting is an essential part of being a child of God. It's something that's so necessary for you and I. Jesus talks and expects and has urged you and I to fast. It's, it's part of what we, we do as believers, and I kind of want to unpack that this morning. And here's the other thing that I, I want you to get this morning, is that fasting is the faster way to get through the challenges of your life. Let me, let me tell you that this morning. Fasting is the fastest way to get through the challenges of your life. And if you have a challenge that you have experienced year after year after year, and you're struggling with it, uh, and you want that challenge to go away, then I would challenge you to fast over that idol. When's the last time, here's a good question, when's the last time that you fasted over the problem or the challenge in your life that you're experiencing? For instance, you may have a relational problem that's going on, and it's been difficult for years and years and years, and you've never fasted over that situation. When's the last time you fasted over your marriage? You said, Lord, I'm committing a week to hear from you. I'm fasting over my marriage. I'm fasting over my relationship with my daughter or my son. There's an issue there that's been going on for years, and I, I can't get past it. Have you ever set a time aside to fast, get before the Lord for the purpose of getting close to God, hearing from God, and then finding a, a, a way to get through it? Now, here, here's what I know. Fasting is the faster way. But here, if you're, not, if you're like me and like the world we live in, have you ever met somebody that just got divorced? They will drop 20, 30 pounds in a heartbeat. I mean, it just happens. It's probably one of the most noticeable times that it, when the relationship struggle is going bad, uh, when we lose somebody we love, when we have a problem with a teenager or a young person in our life and they kind of abandon us, we lose weight, we're sick to our stomach. And in that moment, here's what's going on. The food that I so desperately enjoy and want doesn't fix the problem that I have. And in that moment, I'm so sick, I don't want food. And what I really, really want, 
Because I want help. I want help in my marriage. I want help with this child. I want help with my family, my finances. Have you ever been so worried about your future? Things will never change. It's always going to be this way. Nothing's ever going to change. And here we are. We've got a future problem that makes us sick to our stomach. And we end up fasting anyways. And the problem is, though, is if you're having a relationship problem, a finance problem, a future problem, a, a, a family problem, a friendship problem, any one of those problems... You can get, it can go south so bad, and you can go years and years with that, that, that you're just sick to your stomach. You're, you're, in many ways, you're fasting. You just don't know it. But the great thing about fasting with God is there's a purpose behind it. I'm taking time. I, I remember there was a time in one of my brother's lives where their marriage was just really going through a tough time. And my, my brother committed a fast, and he prayed every day for his marriage. I mean, he fought on his knees for his marriage. And here's the question. You and I both know insanity is what? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's insanity, right? But we can go years and years with the same financial problem. We can go years and years with the same relationship problems. We can go years and years with a, a, an addiction problem, a, a challenge problem, and, and we're not doing anything different. And, and Jesus would tell you and urge you this morning that you should fast. That there's something going on inside of you that you can't, you can't get through this without his help. And fasting is, is this, a biblical fast, and that's what we're talking about, versus just not eating. A biblical fast has to do with I have this purpose in mind that, and I'm, I'm choosing to set aside food that I love and need so desperately, but I'm recognizing and I'm telling you, Lord, I need you more than I need this food. I need your wisdom in this relationship more than I need this food. I'm letting you know that you're a greater priority in my life than the food and the things that I enjoy in this life and the things that are necessity in my life, I still recognize you as being more important. And in recognizing that you are more important, I'm needing your wisdom to change me in my relationship. Now, don't go into a fast and go, Lord, I'm not eating. And I'm not eating until you fix him. Amen. That's it. <laughs> You got to fix him. You got to fix that kid. You got to fix my finances. And it's, it's not like a showdown with the Lord, okay? You're saying, Lord, I have tried to manage my finances my way. For many years, it's never gone well. And for the first time, I'm recognizing I want it to be different this next year. I want your blessings over it. And so I'm humbly coming before asking for your wisdom to you tell me what I need to do to fix my financial problem. And as risky and dangerous as that prayer is, I'm going to do whatever it is you ask me to do, and then I'm going to watch your favor come over my finances. I could tell you story after story, but uh, and you can authenticate this with Mama Margaret, but uh, Mama Margaret, much like uh, Sister Lampley, was a, a lady in our church who uh, was here before I got here, and, and her husband and her pastor of this church for many years, she sat right over there, and she got like $700 a month. She was a widow. She had a son living with her, $700 a month. I mean, I don't know how you live off of $700 a month, but every, every week, she, she would tithe. Every month, I, it would end up, I would get this $70 check. For tithe. And she would take $15 above and beyond her tithe because she knows the Lord wants us to give an offering. And she would give that away and for missions or to bless somebody. And she did that for, I don't know, how many years, Mama Margaret, about 10, 15 years? Mama Margaret does the same thing, but she won't, she's going to be mad because I said it out loud in front of you. Okay. So you got to forgive me. We're in church. Okay. Uh, and for years, I would watch supernaturally the Lord take care of her. There was uh, years that she told me, you know, if you know taxes in Napa, that's like three grand come around the end of the year. It could be two thousand, three thousand dollars just for property taxes. I mean, that's that's almost all over seven hundred dollars for two or three months. And in the Lord's supernatural, when she told me this, I, I didn't even know what was going on at first. I didn't know what the situation was when I first got here. 
And she would, she was simply telling me, the Lord sent me a check out of the blue the other day. It was so special. I go, well, tell me about it. Well, I was, you know, I got, I don't, you know, I got property taxes and, you know, and then she began to explain to me how much money she gets. And the, somewhere 10 years ago, somebody owed me $3,000. I never knew about it. And the check just showed up today. Isn't the Lord good? He's going to take care of my taxes. You know, he always takes care of me. I mean, that lady never worried a day in her life. It kind of makes you mad sometimes because I'm going, why can't I be like her? Why can't I rest in his favor? Uh, from that point on, uh, we as a church took care of her property taxes. Uh, from that point, if the Lord didn't supernaturally provide, we were there to provide because that's the right thing to do. A widow in our church who needed help. But what am I telling you? Uh, it would have been very easy for her to not manage her finances God's way. It would have been real easy in that situation to say, hey, listen, I'm a widow. This is not good. But I would watch miracle after miracle uh, happen in her life. The same thing will happen in a relationship. God will ask you in a difficult relationship that you've never been able to try quite fix it. And, and, and if you're not careful, though, here's what happens. But you need to fix them, all right? If they... If you could tweak them and make them right, then, then I'm all in. <laughs> Here's what the Lord's going to tell you. You need to be all in before he changes or before she changes. You need to love your wife as I love the church. Wives, you're to submit as if your husband is Jesus. You know, treat him like the head of the home. Now, he is going to make mistakes, and he's not Jesus, and he's, there's going to, there may be a moment where, and I understand there's unique moments, but there may be a moment where he's trying to ask you to do something unbiblical, and it wouldn't be right for you to follow that. I, I get all of that stuff, but listen to me. The idea is that your love towards him or her is the same type of love that Christ shows to his bride. And his bride back to him. And when we love the way that Christ asks us to do, relationships are healed and they're mended. You know, there's some times where there's just literally a demonic attack on your family. Do you know that? The Bible is real, real clear that there's times where you and I will fast because there's a demonic stronghold. There's literally an intent by the devil to wreck your marriage to take your child, break relationship with you so your spiritual influence will go away so the devil can get them out where they want. There's times where there's a demonic attack on your finances. And the Lord would say, fast. Come talk to me. Give undivided attention. Refrain from something, food in this case, and make me the first priority and then watch what I will do. Or you could complain for the next five or six years till it gets really, really bad, really, really desperate. You're going to get sick to your stomach. You're going to lose weight. Your body's going to suffer. And then you're finally going to fast because you got no other choice and you're just exhausted. Wouldn't it be faster to fast now, earlier, and get through that challenge? And I think sometimes uh, we all want to fast and want the Lord's help in our life. But if we're not careful, we just get busy or we forget about fasting and we just forget to make that part of the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. And so the challenge for you this morning, the challenge for me is let's do a biblical fasting. What is biblical fasting? Now, I've given you a whole bunch of paperwork. Here's the good news. The good news is I'm not teaching all of that this morning. Most of that is for you to take home and read it so you'll have a better understanding of what a biblical fast is all about, how to go about it, and the benefits of it, and what the Bible says about biblical fasting. Imagine if I fast. If I fast, if I really want help in my life and I choose to fast, then this is what will happen. If I, if I want to do this, I, I will uh, fast, I need to obey Jesus. Just by fasting, I will be obeying Jesus. If I fast, the result of that will be strength in my faith. My relationship with him will get stronger. If my relationship with him gets stronger, then I hear more clearly what he asks me to do in the relationship that hasn't been going well for years, but now I have is his input 
and it can get better. Number three, if I fast, it positions myself to find God's will. You really want God's will in your life? Fast. Jesus, uh, Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. He went and he got baptized by John the Baptist. A dove came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit, and a voice from heaven came down and said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus launches his public ministry at the age of 30. He will go three years going around doing amazing miracles, and he will end up at a cross. And before he does all of that, before he launches his ministry and, and lives out his purpose, and he wants to do it with wisdom and all of that, he is led by the Holy Spirit in the desert for 40 days to fast, to get it right. Lord, I want to get this right. I need to stay connected to you. It would have been easy, you know, man, I need to get on, you know, Facebook. We got to start Jesus ministry, man. We got to get a social club going. We got to do this. We got to do that. I got to build my church. Uh, you know, I need to take out some past, you know, some, uh, some stuff with Google. I need Google to get in here and throw my, my ministry title up there and do some advertising. There's a whole bunch of things that start running through your mind when you start to fix your problem. And Jesus said, so before I even do this, I'm going to make sure I sit down and talk to my Heavenly Father. Get his picture of what my future looks like. And I'm going to walk in that with his wisdom. And then I will find his will. It will work out and everything will be absolutely amazing. And there's nothing wrong with doing your best to solve your problem. But it can't be the end all, right? You, you can't do your best and say, I need God to do the rest. And never fast or have a talk with him or a prayer time and read your Bible so he can help. And God says, I want to be a part of your problem. I want to be the one that brings the solution. It gives him a great moment to demonstrate his love for you. He loves you more than you know. More than you know. Uh, on one of the papers that you, you have uh, in your, your packet... And it's the one with the Foothill logo on top. You'll see Jesus urges you and I to fast. Jesus urges you and I to fast. In Matthew 6, 16 and 17, Jesus says, when you fast, it was part of the culture of the children of God to fast. And most of them fasted once a week on a certain day of the week. And uh, it was part of the lifestyle. And again, it's setting aside. And I'm asking you, what? This morning, what is it? We're going to refrain from food. And, and if you're going to just refraining from food doesn't solve the whole problem. OK, if we're not careful, we're just on a diet. OK, and, and, and I could use one of that, too. Here's the great thing about biblical fasting. You're losing weight and you're getting closer to Jesus. Amen. If you're uh, just fasting and you're not doing any food, you're losing weight. Good for you. But you don't really have a purpose to get close to God. So a biblical fast is not only I'm refraining from food, but I'm spending a more intent time. I've purposed within myself to develop a closer relationship with the Lord, spend more talking time with Him. So the, the great way to do this, let's imagine that if you were on a biblical fast, that in the morning, rather than have that lovely Danish that's all got cinnamon on it, and it's like a cinnabon from heaven, amen, <laughs> and a coffee, I would just maybe have a spot of sugarless tea, <laughs> and I would open up my Bible, and I would say, Lord, rather than eat a breakfast this morning, I just want to start the day with you. And you know what my particular life challenge is. This is what I'm concerned about, and I want to Put it in your hands, and then I just want to talk to you. I want to pray about it. Then I want to set it aside. I want to pray about our relationship. Because I understand if I get closer to you, I'll hear from you. I'll be able to know what I need to do today to stay in a positive frame of mind and have a hope and peace that my problem is going to be overcome this year. Because I'm fasting and coming to you recognizing that you're the answer to my finances. You're the answer to my family, to my friend's relationship, to my future. You're the answer. And so I set these things aside purposely to read in your word and talk with you. Now, I can pray and talk to the Lord. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and I'm going to let him talk back to me by reading his word. And you'll open up this word and you'll hit Ephesians chapter 5 and it'll start talking about relationships. He'll start talking about your relationship with your boss at work. 
He'll start talking about all kinds of stuff. And for the first time, it will jump off the page differently than it has in the past. And it will change you. You'll, there'll be a change of heart inside of you. And when the change of your heart changes, then the circumstances around you start getting solved and they get better. I want to look just real quickly. Uh, you have this paperwork with you as well. And I want you to look at, we're talking about biblical fasting. Uh, number two talks about uh, biblical examples of purpose of fasting. I've given that to you because I want you to see in the Bible where many times fasting was the problem solver. But I, I want to look at you for, or have you look at item number three, the wrong motivations in fasting. It says, um, wrong motivations for fasting is to just be seen by others. Now, have you ever been fasting and somebody walks up and goes, hey, you want to have lunch? And, you know, you want lobster? And you're just going, no, no, no. That guy shows up, you know. And in that moment, you're wanting to go, uh, I need to tell him I'm fasting, but the Bible says if I tell him I'm fasting, then I lose all my credit with God because then, you know, if you're just fasting to, to look good in front of other people and you feel guilty if you say out loud, I'm fasting. Now, listen, this passage in the Bible is not saying you can't talk about fasting. And the truth is that why we do a corporate fast every year at January, it's a great season of life, isn't it? It's the, a strategic season of life. In the beginning of the year, we all decide to sit down and look at our calendar, our finances, and our fitness. Amen. Not necessarily in that order. Okay. And we want to do it better next year. I want to do all those things better. The only way to do that is come up with a plan. So I got to come up with a plan, and I want to do it better. And, and truly, we do it corporately because many times when you're fasting with others, we energize each other. We support each other. We're accountable to each other. Uh, my brother came one time and we were doing a, a liquid fast, you know, and he comes up. He goes, man, I got to confess. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, I broke my liquid fast. He goes, I did, but I kind of didn't. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, like, I took a a piece of pizza, I stuck it in a blender, and I spun it until it turned into fluid, and then I drank it. <laughs> I said, well, if you feel guilty, then you're guilty, okay? You need to talk to God about that. But, but listen, it, it's okay for us to talk to each other about our fast. But when this, the, the Bible talks about a wrong motivation, when, when if, you know, if you're walking through Denny's going, I'm not going to have anything to eat today, I'm fasting trying to get close to God because I'm a spiritual person and I love God more than you guys do because I'm fasting. You're not fasting. See that, that would be what this passage is trying to talk about. So if somebody comes up and says, you know, Hey, you know, you want some lobster today? Man, listen, I'm going to write this date down. I'm going to put it in my phone and we're going to do this next week when the fast is over. Number one. Okay. Number two, I'm fasting and they're going to go, well, what's that all about? It's just, you know, it's something that we should do as, Christians, and that's what I'm doing this week. I'm going to spend more time getting close to God. I'm going to re read my Bible more, and I'm going to refrain from eating. And an unbeliever is going to look at you like, you say, what? You're not going to eat? Are you crazy? Are you going to kill yourself? No, no, no. Listen, I'm just, God's more important to me than food. Really? Yes. And, and so that's why I'm doing it. And there's nothing wrong with having that discussion. But I remember in the old days, man, like, I can't tell anybody I'm fasting or I'll lose my blessing. It's not like that, okay? That's one reason uh, that's wrong for fasting. Another reason that's a wrong motivation for fasting is for being justified by God. You know, you're not, you're, we're not fasting and going, God, I need to be right before you. I need to be right before you. Please let me be right before you. Uh, let me be forgiven. And I'm not, that, that would mean that I'm working for my innocence. I'm working and my energy and my, my works is what gets me good credit with God. That's the wrong motivation for fasting. Jesus died on a cross for you. You're already forgiven. You've been justified. God says, you're my child. I forgive you. The fasting thing is for us to get close. It's not about getting rid of, you know, a past sin or you feeling guilty about something. He, he's saying, I've already forgiven you. So that's, that's a done deal. 
This is just about helping you with maybe feelings of unforgiveness. But, but you don't go into a fast to try to earn God's love. He already loves you, okay? He loves you more, and that will never change. Another wrong motivation for, for fasting is to uh, commend God. Food will not commend us to God. We are neither uh, the worse if we do not eat, nor are the better if we do eat. Fasting does not cause us to earn something from God, but helps us to be more receptive. Everybody say receptive. Amen. Receptive. How many of you want to be more receptive to God? I know I do. And, and here's what I know. It seems like God doesn't want to talk to me. But if I'm honest with myself, I'm so busy, my wife can't hardly get my attention to talk to me. Amen? And so sometimes fasting uh, puts me in a position, gives me a plan to say, okay, breakfast time, I'm reading my Bible. Lunch time, I'm not eating. During that time when I would normally eat, I'm now going to sing worship songs and talk to the Lord in prayer. That night, I'm going to read his word. During dinner, rather than eating dinner, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend more time with him. So it's a plan to move my relationship closer to the Lord. He, here's the right motivations for fasting. Uh, a repentance. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm going to the Lord and uh, I need to repent. And I need to forgive somebody that I'm struggling with forgiving. Now, that's a good motivation. Lord, I love you. I know I'm supposed to forgive them. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I've been trying to forgive them, and I can't get there. I need you to help me to forgive them, and I want to repent of this problem, and I want to get it past me, and I need your help. And he goes, okay, I'll help you. Number two, spiritual strength against an enemy attack. Do you know sometimes you're under an attack, and, and you don't know that. You just think, uh, the Lord doesn't like me. He's letting bad things happen to me. And the Lord's going, man, I need you to like soldier up. Let's, let's fight this together. Let's do this. We, we can do this. To break demonic bondages. This, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So Matthew 17, 21 says that there are times when you're praying for a demonic force that's controlling somebody or at least oppressing somebody. And it's, it's got them in emotionally spun out. They've been that way for years and years. And you need to come in prayer and fasting and then come and make that thing leave in the name of Jesus. Amen? To awaken a spiritual hunger for God. Somebody said this. I, I forget who it was. I, want to, I think it was John Piper. He's a great uh, preacher. He said, fasting has to do with being more homesick for my Lord and Savior and to go home with him. Then I more hungry and homesick for him than I am hungry for the food that I get today. Fasting is an expression that I love you so much that I want to be with you, Lord, and I can't wait for that day. Uh, there's another one here to test and see what desires control us. You, know, you go into fasting and you say, Lord, why do I got these issues? And he goes, okay, let me help point them out to you. Because you don't know what they are, so you don't know how to uh, attack the problem. And so I go to him, I say, here's the problem I'm struggling with. And he goes, here's the desire that's maybe a little out of control. Let, let's fix that. And he says, I'll help you. To forfeit good things for the better and the best. To express our ache for his return. To demonstrate our love and desire for God above all things. That's, that's what fasting is. If somebody walks up to you and says, you know, uh, can we eat today? And you say, no, I'm fasting. They're going to look at you like, what kind of person doesn't eat? I mean, like, you're into this thing, serious. You, you must, here's the thought. You must really love the God you serve, and I don't know if he's real or not, but you're serious about this. And that's true. I mean, would you just not eat for some of your coworkers? No. <laughs> I mean, I love, like those guys. I love them. But, you know, I ain't just ditching food for them. I mean, there's not a lot of motivation there. But I'm, I'm ditching food for the King of Kings, the Lord of the Lords, and the one died on a cross for me. So I get to spend eternity in heaven, and I get heavenly help here on earth. I'm demonstrating what's in my heart through a physical action of fasting. Amen? Amen. And then uh, to divide our bread with the poor, the house, the homeless, the poor, to loose the bonds of wickedness and let the oppressed go free. 
You know, sometimes we fast corporately, not only for ourselves and in our lives, but for our church, for our family, our extended family. Sometimes, when I'm fasting, a church is part of that. Where are we going as a, a spiritual family? Where, where are you directing us? We want to get it right so we can not only be blessed as a spiritual family, but that you might have more children in your home. Amen? Amen. So, do you want to fast? <laughs> here's, here's the action step, all right? I've got you moving in that direction. I'd like you to take this week. I dare not ask you to fast on New Year's. Amen. <laughs> so we are not fasting this week. It would be wrong because we're not that strong. Amen. Because there's going to be a New Year's Eve party and there's going to be lobster there. Okay. And I want to eat it and you do too. Uh, next uh, Sunday, after our potluck, which will be the Last Supper, uh, we, we are going to challenge you to do a seven-day devotional fast with us as a church. We'll do it corporately, okay? Now, many of you have different health restrictions, and I get all that, and you need to work that through a doctor. Don't go crazy. Uh, just uh, do what the Lord tells you to do, okay? And we'd like you to do a seven-day fast. Uh, and... and we're going to start right after that Sunday, and then the following Sunday, uh, we will all close the service and run out and get a, a giant steak anywhere we can because we're going to be so hungry. But I'd like for you to do that, and what we've given you today is a seven-day uh, kind of focus, a devotional focus for those seven days. Day one says, let's draw close to the Lord. Let's just, Lord, I'm not eating this morning, and I want to... Remind myself how much you love me, and I'm going to respond with, to that and tell you back how much I love you. Day two, Lord, I, I want to focus on being filled with your power and your purpose. If you've never uh, asked the Holy Spirit to help you and empower you to do life here on earth, you need to focus on it that day. Don't focus on the problem. You're just focusing on the power that will solve the problem. Holy Spirit, I, I need your help. My problem is bigger than me. I need your help. Day three, to find and fulfill your destiny. Lord, I have this future, and this is what I want. I want to make sure my future is actually the same future you want for me. If I'm fighting for a future that's not what you call me to, then I'll be frustrated for a long, long time. And fasting makes things go faster, and that simply means I, I get the problem solved and I move forward faster when I do it that way, rather than limp along year after year, never fasting over my problem and never getting God's direction. So day three, we're going to say, Lord, I yield my future to you. I want your help and your strategy because it will be the best one for me. It'll include the most handsome man in the whole world if you're single. Amen. The most amazing lady of God if you're single. Um, it will repair marriages and families and all those things. So I want your future for my life. Day four, to experience God's presence and power. You know, that's a day where you want to just run a whole lot of worship music. Say, Lord, I'm still, I'm not just trying to throw my problem out there to you right away. Right now, I just want to remind myself of how great it is. Grab five or six of your favorite worship songs and roll them around. Just put them on a spin loop. Do it morning, midday, that night. It, it'll just be amazing. And hopefully, it will not re help you not remember how hungry you are. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, day five, to walk in wisdom and revelation. So I want insight on my, my life. What are some of the choices I need to make today and this week that will help me walk out of the challenge that's been beating me up for a couple of years? Or maybe just this year, maybe a month. Let's get rid of them. Let's get past them quickly. Fasting makes things go faster. Day six, to experience revival. You know, we all want, and in the Bible, it, there's uh, scriptures there that say, Lord, we want a renewed presence. On that day, I'd like you to be praying for our church. We want to experience the power of God in our worship on Sunday morning greater than we ever have. And we want unbelievers to walk through the back door and go, man, there's something about this place. I mean, the people are awesome. They all look handsome, super pretty. You know, that's a given. Okay. And, uh, but there, there's this presence of their Heavenly Father here. I can't deny there's something that's warm and peaceful and, and powerful. Amen? And then day seven, uh, pray for your pastor. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
Yeah, I'd like to say I plugged that in there, but Pastor Rick did this, so blame him. Okay, uh, but do pray for your pastor because as we pray corporately, I need to lead us as a spiritual family in the right direction this new year. All right? How, how many of you will? How many of you are already praying for your pastor? <laughs> Okay, good, good, good. Just keep it up. And all of those, I invite you in because the Lord needs a lot of work with me. He needs more than one, a couple of people praying for me, okay? Uh, yeah, ask my wife. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so listen, listen. Fasting gets you through the challenge of life faster. Then the opposite is true. If you're not fasting at all, maybe you're living in a problem a lot longer than you should be. And Jesus would say, do this. And when Jesus did it, he moved forward in his ministry for three years, did the most amazing things that's ever been known to mankind. So I'm challenging you to do that. Now, fasting, again, there's paperwork here that talks about a vegetarian fast, uh, a Daniel fast, a water and juice fast. Uh, you pick the one that fits you. I want you to be praying and thinking about that this week. But I kind of want you to declare something next Sunday. I'm going to challenge you to just go tell one person, this is the fast I'm attempting to do for this week. And listen, if you choke on Tuesday and you have the lobster, this is what will happen. You go, oh, I choked. It's over. I'm out. You know, and then you don't fast at all. No, listen, just get back and just, you know. Get back in the game and keep fasting. God's not so disappointed with you. He don't want to talk to you anymore or anything like that. He just wants you to stay in the game. Just keep pushing to get closer to him. If it makes you feel better, add a day to your fast. Do whatever. It's stay in the game. and keep. It's not about guilt and condemnation. If you get into that, then you, this isn't going to work. How can it be guilt and condemnation if I come and spend more time with my father who loves me more than life itself? He's going to go, oh, I can see why you got that lobster. That's a really good tasting lobster, but let's get back. All right, come on, let's talk, okay? Let's get back in the game. That's, that's his heart towards you. So, so don't let it get legalistic. If you let it get legalistic, you're missing the point. It's just pushing into uh, a more intense relationship with your Heavenly Father. Um, I do have some verses up here, and we're running out of time, but I'm going to have you... Go home and read it in Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 13. I'd like for you that to be something you read this week. And it's Jesus going on his 40-day fast. He's attacked by the devil, and he. I want you to read that yourself and see what Jesus' response to the devil is during the fast. The fast will be difficult. Here's what will happen. It'll be really, really hard probably day two and day three. Day four, surprisingly, it will actually get better. Day five, your body is adjusted to actually not eating that much. Uh, in, in many times, day six and seven, it's pretty easy to maintain the fast. You don't have all the cravings. Having said all that, depending on what type of fast you have, you want to be careful not to go have a steak on Monday. Okay, at the end of the fast, because your body's all over the map. You might want to start with soups and gradually work up to steak and lobster again, okay? So that's just my little position thing. All right, would you bow your heads this morning? Lord, I, I love you desperately. And I'm reminded when we talk about fasting, how much I need your help and influence in all my life. Choices and decisions, I need you in the center of it. Fasting reminds me how desperately I really need your help. The great news is when I push into you, I draw close to you. The Bible says you draw close back to me. And then you unlock the areas that I need help in, that I've been unable to unlock in my own labor and in my own efforts. And then suddenly... There's a break in a relationship that's been bad for a long time, and there's help and healing and forgiveness. There's a break in our finances, and you come in and you do a miracle. And in friendships, and in my future, Lord, some of us, Lord, are so concerned with our future that it keeps us anxious. And Lord, we, we want to yield our future to you. 
and say, Lord, have your will and your way so we can experience peace as we move in that direction and have the confidence that you have it all under control and it's going to be amazing. Lord, remind us of the necessity to fast. And may the motivating factor be that when I fast, I get through my problems faster because I've invited you into the center of it. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so go home this week, pack on 20 pounds because next <laughs> week you're going to lose it. Have all the lobster you want. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. If you enjoyed the message today and you want to partner with us to reach others for Christ, click the link down below to give now.